true freedom is in Christ alone. True freedom is in Christ alone. We'll take our text in John chapter 8. We'll read verses 31 through 36. And if you will, I'll ask you to stand just in honor and reverence to the reading his holy and errant, infallible word. Verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered to him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant which abideth not, and, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this congregation this morning. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity, Lord, to be in your house. And Father, as we stand here, we stand just as humble as we know how. Lord of flesh, and Father, we need your spirit. We need the anointing of your spirit, and Father, the unction of your spirit. And Father, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice today. Lord, that you speak into their heart, Lord, these words of life, these words of truth. And Lord, may we grow. And Father, we pray that your spirit just does that that's intended here today. And Father, if there's that one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, they may not be sure of their salvation. I pray today that you speak into their heart, Lord, in a way that can help them, Lord, to be willing, God, to commit their life to you. Lord, is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name and for your sake and for your glory. Amen and amen. And you can be seated. Now, we've just celebrated in our nation the, the, our, the independence of our nation. And the very thought and idea of freedom has been really, really on our, all of our mind, I think. And we realize that 237 years ago that America won its independence from Great Britain. And I want to I want to reiterate the fact of what we we won our independence from, and what we what we what we got independence for. We got independence from Great Britain, so we didn't have to live under their rules. But we got independence so that we could live under the rules that our Constitution allows for us to have in America. And a lot of people has taken this very concept of liberty and justice for all and have taken it that I don't have to do anything, I don't have to obey nobody, I'm under bondage to no one. And I think that that very thought has been prevalent in America so long until it has really hurt our moral aspect of the living in America today. But you see, no one really likes to be in bondage. There's, and there's a lot of ways that a person can experience bondage. There's bondage to what we're seeing in our society today. Uh, people who are in bondage to drugs, people in bondage to alcohol, people are in bondage to some type of uh, sexual Im Im perversion, uh, pornography, all kinds of things that people get in bondage to. You see, nations, they don't like to be in bondage, even. During the, the Revolutionary War, Patrick Henry, one of the uh, people who was involved in the American Revolution, he's, his cry was this, give me liberty or give me death. In other words, give me that freedom or either let me die. So see, I don't know of anybody who likes to be in bondage. Anybody, you put an animal in a zoo, put him in a, in a cage when he's used to being loose and free, and he'll just about seem like walk himself to death around the edge of the cage. He just, they just, they, they're looking for that freedom. They want to be set free. And as far as nations goes, just right now we're watching Egypt in turmoil. And I believe I understand now what's going on in Egypt where a few days ago I didn't understand but here's what I've come to realize that Egypt was a land that they've tried to do a democratic type election, which they did. And in that democratic election, they was able to elect this Morsi, who is a Muslim leader, one of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so now, through their democratic process, they had elected a Muslim leader, which they realized was going to be one who was going to cause them to live under the 
the Muslim law, the strictness of the Muslim law, and as we've seen the revolt in the streets, and now the army has taken over in a coup, and they set up another guy, the reason why they wanted, they wanted to be free, they didn't want no religious order telling them what to do either. Not only, but see, that just goes to speak of the heart of man. Man is wanting to be free. Man's wanting to do his own thing. He wants to do it the way he wants to do it and don't want to live under any type of law. And the Lord Jesus, being who he is, being the, the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, came here to earth, and he knows what is in the heart of man. And the Lord Jesus also knows that mankind in Adam nature is in bondage to sin. They cannot break the bondage to sin on their own. But in our text today, I want you to notice in our text that it describes how anyone that chooses can experience true freedom. Now I want you to think about true freedom. We're not talking about just different types of little freedom here and a little freedom there. But I'm talking about complete liberty and complete freedom. And it's only, you're only going to find it, as you can well understand in this passage of scripture, you can only find it in the Lord Jesus himself. Now I want to show you from how the scripture describes that. Look, first of all, I want you to notice the progression to freedom. How do we get to that freedom? We find that in verses 31 and 32. And now Jesus here was talking to some of the Jews and it seemed as if some of them had actually believed on him because he said, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. They hadn't really took in everything about him. They didn't really understand him to be the Lord of hosts. They didn't see all that, but they did believe that he was doing some great things. But he told them here in verse 31, said, if you continue in my word. Now, here's what we can see, this progression to freedom. Here's the word I want you to notice, that if we're going to have complete freedom in Jesus, it's going to take perseverance. It's going to take perseverance. Because he said here, if you continue in my word, then are you, my, you, are you my disciples indeed. You see, there, there must be a perseverance. There must be a continuation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who, who is it that would put their hand to the plow and then turn back? The Bible says they're not worthy of him if they do that. So you see, there's something about knowing and coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and sticking with the stuff. We see so many people today who will come and they'll go through the motions of receiving the Lord Jesus and being saved and we tell them they're saved and, and they go on about their way. But you see, do they continue in Jesus? Do they continue in the way that... See, the, the popular idea today is that, well, at one time, at some point in place that you made a profession of faith and that, that you were saved, then you're saved eternally. And I, I'm, I'm one that believes in eternal security. But there are some conditions to that eternal security. That eternal security is proven out in your lifestyle. You prove whether or not you are a child of the living God. You continue in the Word of God. You continue in the way of God. And I'm not talking about these failures, these sins that Satan sneaks up on us. We get caught in bondage. Eventually you'll break free from that. You'll be right back into the Word of God, seeking after God, following after His ways. So Jesus says here that there is, said, tell, told these Jews, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Think about the parable of the sower that we find in Matthew 13. You'll find, you'll find in that parable that Jesus, that Jesus talked about several things there. He, he talked about, he talked about the, the wayside where some seed fell. He talked about the stony places where some fell. And he, he talked about some of the seed that sown falls among thorns. So you see, everyone that hears the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not suitable ground for the word of God taking root and growing in them. But then you see that some of the seed that he sowed fell on good ground. And the Bible says they begin to bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. But here's what happened. You can almost see that there's only 25% in this parable that Jesus talked about who really understood the Word of God and believed the Word of God. And I believe in our society today, if Billy Graham considers 75% of the church members not right with God, there must be something wrong in America today. Somebody's not been telling them the truth. Somebody's not been preaching the Word of God to them. And there's one thing I'm going to do when I stand before God. I want to stand before God and say, hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
I called you to do something. You were faithful in doing it. You told the people they need to give their life to Jesus completely, wholeheartedly, and not just some half-hearted profession to the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm going to be free, I'm going to be free in Jesus Christ. I can only be free in him. I can't be free any other way except through the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, the Jews didn't even really understand that they were in bondage. But here, now, now notice, now think about this perseverance. Look what the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, 17, 18. Here's, here's what he prayed. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. See, there are continuance in the word. The eyes of your understanding being lightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, why did the Lord Jesus call? Why, why did he call me to start with? What good am I to him? But see, there's some understanding the Spirit of God wants you to know why you're called, why you're a Christian today. It bless you when you realize that you know that really God really wants you and God really wants you part of his family and why you're in him. Listen, there is a need to have continuance in the word. Continue in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in verse 32, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Here's what you gotta understand. This truth is not just a bunch of doctrinal things and laws for us to obey. This truth is a person. This truth is Jesus Christ our Lord. And our knowledge needs to be of who Jesus is and who he is to us and who we are to him. And then when we begin to understand those things, that's why we need to stay in the word of the Lord. Because Satan leads us off, leads us, sidetracks us, and confuses our mind in so many ways so it's hard to really understand. But see, we must continue in the word of the Lord. Now the next thing I want you to notice is this. Some people fail to realize that they're even in bondage. They, they don't recognize the bondage. These people that Jesus was talking to fell in that category. Look with me in verse 30, 33. He said, and they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? In other words, what are you talking about? We've never been in bondage to nobody. We're, we're free as we can be. Now these were Jews talking and they understood themselves because they were the chosen seed of God that they were free. But here's what I want to call your attention to. That if you look in the book of Judges, there was about seven different times that Israel fell into bondage. They, were, they, they disobeyed God and, and moved into the place to where they, they were tuck over and God would raise up some judge and deliver them from that bondage. They went in for 400 years, was in bondage to Egypt. And now they say, but they say, we've never been in bondage. How wrong were they? They were blinded to the fact that they were even in bondage. They didn't understand that. They went into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. But nevertheless, they're saying, they're telling Jesus here, we've never been in bondage. We, we, we've, we've never, we've never, we've, we've never been in bondage. You see, they didn't understand that they were even in bondage. Now, Jesus here was talking about, when he was talking about this bondage, the Jews knew what, what Jesus had reference to. In Genesis 21.10 and then also Galatians 4 and 30, we find that the Apostle Paul here in Galatians 4 is reminding, he says, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Remember the story there of Ishmael and of Isaac. Sarah told Abraham, no, this bondwoman's son is not going to be heir you cast them out, and that's exactly what Abraham did. God told that, go, you obey, you listen to Sarah, and you send them away. So you see, there's no possibility for flesh to get involved when it comes to the, to the spiritual things of God. It's got to be through the Spirit. It has to be through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you, so you see, he told them, he told them here that, that you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They didn't even recognize they were in bondage. A lot of times today we try to get someone to understand they need Jesus as a Savior. It, it, it don't even register on the Richter scale in their mind. Why do I need to be saved? I'm a good person. I don't do anything wrong. 
They don't realize that they've been captivated in sin through Adam. They don't know the depravity of the sin of mankind. They don't understand that there's a deep abiding sin in the very nature of human beings because of the fall of Adam. They don't realize that they've been separated far, far from God. Nothing but wickedness and depravity in the heart of man. Some people look pretty good on the outside, but no, you get down in there where the true soul is and you'll find that there's all kinds of malignity and, and canker worms eating. There's jealousy, envy, and strife going on in families and homes all across nation, rising against nation, fighting, killing, murdering on all sides. What's wrong? It's because of the bondage of sin that's in mankind. And mankind needs to be free. He needs to be free to do what it is that he needs to do. You see, look what, look what Jesus said in verse 34 there. He answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, now notice, Whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. I want to ask you today, how many of you have sinned? If you have sinned, you are a servant of sin. That's what Jesus Christ himself said. I don't have to justify that statement. Jesus made that statement. It's quite clear that you are a servant of sin. And if the only way to get in, in the only way to get out of bondage to sin is to get in Christ Jesus. To get out of sin, you got to get into Christ Jesus. There's no other way. I want to ask you this morning, what sin has you in bondage and you're not recognizing it? Holy Spirit speaking to some hearts just now. Some of you are in bondage to some stuff. And probably you don't think it's very, it, oh, it ain't much, Brother Bill. It, it don't mean a whole lot. But the Holy Spirit's wanting you to understand it does matter. It is a problem. You need to clear it up. You need to straighten it up. You need to get it right. You see, I just want to I just want to ask you, what are you in bondage to? Or are you in bondage to things? And I know that's a very challenging, challenging question. The third thing I want us to realize here, I want us to realize is the experience of true freedom. The experience of true freedom. Verse 36, listen how Jesus said. He said after, after challenging these, these Jews here, he told them, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, verse 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever. The servant don't stay in the house forever. But here's what he said, But the son abideth forever. I hope that point sinks in real deep into our hearts this morning. The servant don't abide in the house forever. But the son abides in the house forever. Why do you need to be in the Son of God? Because you want freedom. You want to be in the Son of God so you can abide forever. How can you ever hope to have eternal life? How can you ever hope to live forever in heaven with Jesus Christ unless you are in Him? I'm not talking about just a little bit of head knowledge about Him, know who He is, know that you sinned and know that you need a Savior. I'm talking about getting in Jesus. I'm talking about a changed life. I'm talking about a life that whenever somebody preaches your funeral, they don't have to wonder if you're really in heaven or not because they can know from the very character you had that you were in Christ Jesus. I preached the ladies graveside service this Friday. A neighbor. And honestly, honestly, I cannot say that that woman was saved. I'm not going to say she was lost. But I could not, from her, from her lifestyle and what I knew of her, I could not say that she was a saved woman. And it was, it was a hard thing to do. Hard to find words. A funeral of a, of a person who is, you know they've received Christ. Their life exhibits the life of Christ. That is an easy funeral. But buddy, when you have to do one that you don't know for sure, there's a question in your mind. It brings all kinds of feelings and emotions from the inside that's hard to hard to deal with? Am I being faithful to God? Am I being just in what I'm doing? Am I being faithful to Him? You see, Christian life is a life that is noticed by the lifestyle. There is a life that a Christian has to live. Some people are so far in bondage that that life don't show through. Sometimes that life just don't show through. 
So as we think this morning, now in verse 36, Jesus said it. He said, if the Son, now think about true freedom. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son, therefore, make you free, you shall be free indeed. There are some of you here this morning, you know that you've been born of God's Spirit. But yet there's things that you're in bondage to. It ought not be. I want you to understand that there is freedom. There is freedom. It reminds me of a story I read about the island of Jamaica back in July 31, 1838. A man, William Nibs, gathered, they say, 10,000 slaves together there in Jamaica. And they had this night of praise and glory because on the island they had made this proclamation against slavery and at 12 p.m. on that certain night this law was taking effect he gathered these 10,000 people together and they began to whenever the bells tolled at 12 o'clock he let out a yell this monster is dying what was he talking about this monster of bondage this monster this monster of slavery this monster is dying then again the bell tolled again and they were some more joined in with him they began to realize this monster is dying and by the time the bell tolled ten times there it was said that ten thousand people was crying out there that this monster is dying you see that's a wonderful thing to hear that many people declare their freedom and understand that they're no longer in bondage they were no longer in bondage to slavery but you see, there's a sad part to that also, what took place there. On the island of Jamaica, all the people on the island wasn't there at that meeting. They weren't there to hear that proclamation. They didn't know the law had been passed. So what happened? The slave masters kept those people in darkness, kept them in silence. And some of those people continued to live in slavery for a long time, even though by the law, there was a law that said they were free. They was no longer in bondage, but they didn't know that. And for years, those slave masters kept them hid from the truth. You see, in the church world today, I really believe there are some people who fit that category. Jesus has set us free. We are free indeed. But how many people have really continued in his word and understand and know that they are free? Know that they are not, they're, they're not in bondage to Satan anymore. They're not in bondage to sin. They don't have to obey the devil. They can choose and they can make those choices. So as we look at this, we're thinking about what did we experience, the experience of true freedom? What are we free from? Well, we're free from the penalty of sin. We're free from the penalty of sin. You see, sin, sin definitely has, has its penalty. Look with me in Colossians, first chapter, verses 12 through 14. Paul tells us here, he says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, or made us suitable, to be partakers of the inheritance of saints in life. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You see how we've been separated see we've been transferred from the from that from that penalty of sin who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin here's what we have the moment we step into the lord jesus christ here's what we have we are cleansed of guilt our sin is gone we're forgiven of sin and the penalty of eternal death it no longer belongs to us. We've been born again of God's Spirit. And then, see, we're clothed in His righteousness. We're free from condemnation. And we're eternally safe in Christ, no matter how we feel about it. Some of you may feel a lot of condemnation. You may feel a lot of guilt. But here's what I want you to know. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're free from condemnation. You just might not realize it yet. You may not know it yet, but there's freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are dealing with some things in your life that you're free from, and you just haven't stepped up by faith and said, Lord, I claim this in Jesus' name. I'm going to tell you there's great freedom in Jesus. I get so happy preaching about the freedom that's in Jesus. Just so free we are because we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
no doubt in my mind because the word of God's true. It's not based on how I feel. I may get these exuberant feelings, this joyous thing running through my soul when I'm preaching the word of God. But I'm going to tell you, in the quiet times when things are going rough, there's a deep abiding peace knowing that I am free in the Lord Jesus no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way. Whatever comes your way, you can have that assurance because it's a deep abiding peace and a deep abiding assurance that we have in him. Romans 5, 8. Listen to what Paul said. But God commendeth his love toward us that while we be at sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He says much more than now being justified by his blood. See how we're set free from the penalty. Justified we are. One of the major doctrines that we teach is justification by faith. See, it says we, we're now justified by his blood and shall be saved from wrath make you free. You'll know Jesus and Jesus will make you free. That's where freedom comes from. It don't come from my mental ability, my mental thinking. No, Christ is the one that makes us free. We have freedom from the power of sin, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, the presence of sin. Notice what he says. See, the freedom from the power of sin speaks of our sanctification. It, it, and a lot of people are afraid of that word sanctification. But that simply means I'm set apart to be used by God. You see, this deliverance and the penalty of sin is a one-time event. Christ did it on the cross of Calvary, one-time event. This freedom from the power of sin is a daily event, a daily process that happens day by day by day. See, there's a power of sin here in this world that's trying to get through to you, trying to attack your brain, try to get you to do this, trying to get you to do that, but you're holding up the name of Jesus because you know the truth, you know him, you know who he is, you know his power, you know what he's done, and he's acclaimed this and he's accomplished this for you. You do not have to yield to Satan. Let me say that again. You do not have to yield to Satan. He has been defeated. He is a defeated foe. Jesus defeated him when he died the death on the cross of Calvary, went into the grave, went into death, and then he come back. He came resurrected from the grave, oh, had power over death, hell, and the grave. He destroyed the works of Satan by raising back up. And I'm going to tell you, we are alive forevermore in him, church. We are alive forevermore. There's some great promises here. Listen to these. Some of you that are struggling with sin, listen to these promises. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I've heard people say, oh, me and Jesus got our own thing going. That's not what the scripture means. That's not what it means. Look at the next verse. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work it out. Here's what we got to do. We got to work out what God's worked in. He's worked in that salvation. Now let's work out what that is. What is that salvation? It's freedom. It's deliverance. It's you understanding that I'm safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see there's deliverance from the power of sin. We're being saved daily from the power and dominion of sin. Look at Romans 6, 6 with me. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. There's no reason for a born-again Christian who has continued in the word of God to be in bondage to sin. It's only when we don't obey God that you walk in bondage to sin. Look at verse 11 there in chapter 6. Likewise, you also... He says, likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I don't know about you, but one day when Jesus birthed me in my spirit, he raised me from the dead. He raised me from a life of sin. He raised me to a life of righteousness, to a life of holiness, and so did he you. The question is, are you living that life? Are you doing that? He says, as your members, as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Now let me tell you, 
if, if the Lord Jesus knew you could not live without living a sinful life, he would, the Holy Spirit would not have put this in the Bible. Jesus would not have said, if the Son make you free, you'll be free indeed. If the Lord did not intend it to be so, it would never be in here. I'm telling you, sin shall not have dominion over you. That's why we need to know the true freedom that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, we're going to have, we're going to have the freedom from the presence of sin. Right now, you can't get away from it. It's everywhere. They sin lurking all around. There's temptations on every hand that we're constantly swatting it away, swatting it away. Temptation comes from every side. But one day, there's going to be a freedom from the presence of sin. What's that going to be? That's going to be an eternal event. Hallelujah. That's going to be the day whenever we're raptured into glory. That's going to be the day when Jesus steps out and says, time shall be no more. And he sweeps us into that presence. We are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Listen to what, listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. He says, to wit, the redemption of our body. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm eternally saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? This old body don't realize it yet. I have aches and pains. Any of you have those? Sometimes my wife will be watching. She'll be watching me do this or that. Honey, is your neck all right? Well, it's going to be all right. It's going to get all right. You have, we have uh, hip replacements. I didn't have one, but I'm probably going to get one if I live long enough. You see, we have, see this body don't know I'm, that we're saved eternally yet. But there's going to be the day coming when this old body is going to be changed into a glorified body like Jesus. And you know there'll never be another pain, another bit of sorrow, another bit. All this is going to be passed away. Right now we are waiting for that redemption. We're waiting for the adoption of this body to be transformed. Jesus wants us to know the truth. The truth is, I'm not going to be like this all forever. I'm going to have me a glorified body. See, there's a glorification. I'm going to be free from the presence of sin. He, he, the devil may be bothering you right now, but you tell him, oh boy, you better do all you can right now because the day is coming when you won't be around. You're going to be in the lake of fire and you're not going to be bothering God's people anymore. You're not going to be interrupting in God's creation. <laughs> Listen to John, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold, he said, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now think about, think about this. That we should be called the sons of God. I, I wonder, I, I, I really wonder how many of you in my presence here this morning understand that term. That you are a child of the living God. If you don't understand that, you're missing a great blessing in the Lord Jesus. You need to continue in the Word of God, continue in the truth of God, so that you can know the truth. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Don't be surprised that the world will understand why you act the way you act. Look at verse 2. John says this. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Some of you are going to wait till you get to heaven to start being the sons of God. No, you're not. You're either going to be a son of God here now or you won't be there to be a son of God. You're going to be it here and now or you're not going to be it there. So you just plan on if I'm going to go to heaven, I've got to get used to the idea of thinking I'm a child of God. His royal blood now flows through my veins. I'm not worthy, but he said I was. His blood made me worthy. I'm worthy now. I'm a child of the living God. I want God's blessings. I invite God's blessings. I, I, I desire God's blessings all my life. Now, I, I love it whenever I would get out and get involved in nature and get to interact with all God's done, and sometimes it just wells up in my soul. Hallelujah, Lord God Almighty. Praise your mighty name for who you are. Listen, we are a child of God if we're in Christ Jesus. We need to know the truth. He says, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but notice this. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Listen, that day whenever he comes and he splits the eastern skies and we get to behold him in, in reality, here's what I can see taking place. 
it's almost it's almost like that when I behold his glory and all his radiance and all that it's like that I can feel a, the warmth or whatever flowing and I begin to look and hey I, I'm just like him now it's, it's happened I, I'm just like he is now for all eternity that's the way we're going to be I'm telling you, church, it's something to be excited about. It's something to praise God about. No wonder when we sing songs of praise, we can help, hardly help at all, but lift our hands and glorify his holy, mighty name because of who he is and what he's done. I'm telling you, the truth will make you free. If bondage has you this morning, truth, that being Jesus, will make you free. In conclusion, True freedom is found only in knowing the truth. You can know that truth only as you continue in his word and allow God's spirit to reveal the truth about who Jesus really is. Some of you don't know who Jesus really is. That's why you need to continue on in the truth. You say, Brother Bill, I've been a Christian for 30 years and I don't understand what you're saying. You need to understand who Jesus is. You need to know him in truth. You need to let him... He said... If you love me and keep my commandments, he, he told us in John chapter 16, if you love me and keep my commandments, I will reveal myself to you. I will manifest myself to you. The only possible thing that could keep you from knowing the truth is disobedience in your life. Not willing to walk in the ways of God because you want your own way. You don't want to walk in the laws of God. You want, you want to be free where you can do it your way and God will let you do that. But I'm going to tell you, the very end of mankind that don't know Jesus Christ is a pitiful, pitiful look. It's a pitiful story. It's called eternal separation from God in the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. I want you to know this morning, I wish America could understand the truth. The reason America is in the shape it's in is because man don't want to know the truth. They want the world. They want their own freedom. They want to do it the way they want to do it. And we can see the result of that in our society today. People are looking, searching everywhere. They're looking in drugs and alcohol and all kinds of all kinds of things. They're looking for truth. They're looking for they're looking for peace. They're looking for freedom. And all they're getting is more and more bondage, more and more bondage. What's all what's all the broken homes about? Is because people are not satisfied. They're not content. They're not happy. Why? Because they're looking in the wrong places. They're searching in the wrong places. Anything you can do in your community to help people see Jesus, you're helping that community. You're helping that community to grow. This morning, I want to repeat. Listen very carefully. Verse 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Stand with me this morning.